want to go ahead and invite uh, Natter to the stage. He's going to give us the Amplify talk for the day. Natter's talks are always crazy fun because it's just like wizardry to see what he's able to pull off in his talks. No, uh, not trying to set you up for <laughs> uh, too high expectations here, but uh, they're always really fun to watch. So, hey, Natter, how's it going? Hey, hey, what's up? Pretty good. I have a pretty, um, I have a pretty, you know, imp like I wouldn't say impressive demo, but I have a pretty like, you know, large demo and uh, hopefully extensive. I can pull it off. Extensive. I, I tested it out a few times. Um, we're going to build uh, an entire app from scratch, uh, both the back end and the front end um, with a bunch of different APIs on the back end. So we'll see what happens and, uh, you know, hopefully everything works out, but I think you'll enjoy it either way. Awesome. Awesome. All right, then I'm going to let you have as much time as possible to work your magic. So I'm going to let you bring your slides up and then I will leave. So we'll let's test this out real quick, see if you can bring it up. Sounds good. Wait for that, that magic screen share to happen here. All, All right. right. Looks good. I'm backing out. Okay. Okay, cool. Well, um, thank you for the intro and thank you for checking out my talk and welcome to building a highly scalable cloud API gateway. And we're going to be doing two things. We're going to be having, you know, a 10 or 15 minute presentation. And then from the ground up, I want to kind of show you how to actually build one of these API gateways on AWS using GraphQL. And we're going to do that from scratch using CDK. Um, so my name is Nader Dabit. I'm a senior developer advocate at AWS. I currently am leading the DevRel team for uh, AWS web and mobile applications. And I currently have a, a new book that was published that I'm, I'm kind of still, you know, getting the word out about. So if you're interested in some of the stuff that I'm talking about today, check it out. It's called Full Stack Serverless. It's available from O'Reilly Publications. You can get it on Amazon as well. Um, so... This is kind of a tweet that I sent out yesterday, and it kind of really encompasses the idea of the talk that I'm giving today. I said, in my opinion, uh, GraphQL is the ultimate API gateway, regardless of the underlying database that you're using. If your API is only tied to a single database, that's fine. But where it really shines is where it, when it's consuming multiple databases, microservices, and serverless functions. There are a few things that GraphQL really shines at here. Um, of course, there are the typical things that you consider around GraphQL, like real-time subscriptions and um, the granularity that you get for your data, and among other things. But when you're working with a scalable infrastructure, a scalable architecture, um, what I'm going to be talking about today is kind of like where I feel like you can really take advantage of what GraphQL has to offer when you're running it um, you know, at scale within uh, some type of backend like, uh, or, or some type of cloud like AWS. So this is, this is kind of how my talk is gonna be broken up. We're gonna have two sections with this talk and then one live coding demo. Um, we're gonna talk about the GraphQL challenges. So what are the things that people typically run into when they're building an API uh, from scratch, an API server from scratch? Then I'm gonna talk about AWS, uh, AWS AppSync which is a managed GraphQL service that allows you to spin up a GraphQL API um, and uh, kind of host it on AWS. And finally, I'm gonna be building a GraphQL API gateway from scratch using AWS AppSync and AWS CDK. And then we're gonna be connecting that uh, back into a front end React application and testing it out. We'll also be testing it out in the graphical editor um, in AWS. So, we're going to start with uh, challenges. So what are some of the things that people typically, you know, run into when they're building, you know, this type of infrastructure from the ground up? And how can you kind of solve these problems using something like a managed service? And and also, like, when is it right to, to actually take advantage of a managed service versus just building it yourself and managing everything yourself? Because there's a trade-off for each of those. Sometimes, you know, you could think of... Um, uh, and I never think of anything as a silver bullet. There's always going to be better options based on what your use case is and you know your your needs and concerns. So one of the main ones, and one of the ones that we you know are really focused on, is security. So when you think of security, there's a lot of things that kind of fall into this when you're talking about a GraphQL API. You have your typical security concerns like authentication. So when you're building an app, you typically you know. Uh, for most use cases, at least, you typically have multiple types of access. 
So you have private access, you have public access, you might have group role access, all these different types of access patterns. So you want maybe uh, for an app like Twitter for public users to be able to go on and just see your tweets. You might want to allow a user to sign in. And then uh, once they're signed in, they can you know, create their own tweets and delete them and maybe have a profile view. All of that stuff is kind of you know, around authentication and authorization. So once they're authenticated, how do you authorize that user and how do you protect your, your data based on who that user is? And are they in a group? Um, you know, things like that. And then you have GraphQL specific issues around security, like malicious queries. And then you have your basic API concerns like, like DDoS attacks and things like that you have to deal with. So when you're building your API from scratch, you have to kind of you know take all of these things into consideration and you have to build controls and you have to build a system around them to kind of make sure all of these things uh, work uh, as, as expected and also that your endpoint is secure. Uh, the next thing that you typically need to think about if you are launching something that is going to be put into uh, production that you expect to have scale is scalability. So if you're building like, you know, something really basic, maybe like your profile for your um, your personal website, you might not need to deal with this. But if you're building a production application, if you're building something for your company, you're building a startup, you want to be able to handle, you know, a large influx of users, you have to think about scalability. Um, and one of the things that we see that a lot of customers run into with scalability with GraphQL is subscriptions at scale. So once you have uh, a couple of connected clients or maybe a few dozen connected clients, that's typically not an issue. But once you get into the tens of thousands or you get into the hundreds of thousands or even the millions or tens of millions of connected clients uh, running GraphQL, GraphQL subscriptions within a single API endpoint, there are scalability concerns that are very, very difficult and challenging um, engineering problems to solve. Then you have to consider your infrastructure provisioning and underlying and the underlying resources that are you know, managed by that infrastructure. So what happens when you do scale up and scale down? Do you want to provision um, you know, your infrastructure to be able to kind of handle that scale from day one? Or do you want to take like a serverless approach where you kind of have um, you know, a set infrastructure, but when you end up getting that high number of users, you scale up and then scale back down? And how do you actually manage that? And are your data sources that you're working with, are those scalable as well? And then the concern that I'm super interested in, and this is kind of like what I uh, really am, am passionate about, is this idea of developer velocity. And the tooling and the things that I like to work with are typically things that allow me to build quickly and experiment. Um, so when you talk about de developer velocity, there's a few things that come into this. Um, there's the idea of or uh, experimentation. So like if you want to create something and try something new, but you don't know if this thing is going to work out, what are the trade-offs when you can either spin up, you know, this service within a few hours or within a few weeks? And then there's the opportunity cost there. Um, what are, you know, the trade-offs for how long it's going to take to create a new feature when, you know, you have to build everything from scratch or is there some way to kind of like get a head start and take advantage of something that's that's managed? Um, or that it is a good abstraction for you to use. Um, how easy and how hard is it to add additional data sources and implement these security concerns that we talked about earlier across all of your data sources? And then you think about API complexity. Um, so for me, I'm always, I always kind of talk about this idea uh, that code is a liability. So how can, how can you reduce the, the number of lines of code to still get the same feature set, the same security, the same scalability that you expect or that you, that you want from your API? Um, and API complexity affects developer velocity because what happens when you have a new a new user, I'm sorry, a new uh, developer that comes onto your team or maybe even uh, someone that's on your team that's working on um, an area that they haven't touched yet, how hard is it for them to get up to speed because they have you know a lot more code to kind of understand. And then finally, uh, cost. And when I talk about cost, this a little bit ties into this idea of developer velocity in one area here when I talk about opportunity cost. So when I say cost, I'm not just talking about money, but really the, the developer time and the time that it takes you to build things. So when you talk about opportunity costs, if it takes you six months to build something that it takes your competitor one month to build or that you could have built in one month, there's a lot of costs uh, involved in that. Not only are you paying that developer to build that thing or you, you know, yourself having to build it, you're also talking about if you're competing with someone in, in an industry um, that your, your iteration is slower and then uh, over time, that's just gonna snowball and it's gonna hurt you. 
Um, so cost, infrastructure, scalability, uh, developer hours, and opportunity costs. So when you're talking about uh, infrastructure, when you're you know building in a way that you're provisioning infrastructure, regardless if you're going to use it or not, that's an extra cost, right? If you're building in a serverless way where you're paying for the compute time versus the compute um, you know provisioning, then you're operating in more of a way that is um, you know you're not you're not paying for everything up front. You're just going to pay when you're when you have that influx of users. So. With that, with that being said, one of the one of the solutions that we've been able to come up with for our customers that we're seeing a lot of adoption with is called AWS AppSync, which is a managed GraphQL service from AWS. And this is what I'm going to be building out my API gateway using. So API uh, AWS AppSync is a managed service. So why would you consider a managed service? Why would a managed service help um, you know solve some of these problems that I've talked about before? Well, I'm a big fan of the serverless philosophy, and the serverless philosophy basically says if you can build something in a serverless fashion, then you do so. And only uh, when something is not already available do you build it from scratch. When you're dealing with managed services, when you're dealing with um, you know the serverless philosophy, you make assumptions like if there is a team that has spent months and years building this exact feature that you want, and you can buy into it for a low uh, amount of money. And you can kind of get that thing built and uh, you know maintained for you by these expert engineers. Then why build it again from scratch? And this doesn't just you know go into APIs with GraphQL. This is also things like you know API gateways with REST APIs. Um, you can think about managed databases, serverless databases, authentication services, things like Cloudinary, Algolia, Search, all these other things. So when you see something that's that's already built that you can buy into that is a managed service, a lot of times it's it makes a lot more sense because you're saving on the time, you're saving on the cost, you're getting a very quality thing that's already been built for you that you could just buy into. And then you're also um, able to, to only pay for it, you typically for these managed services um, as they're being used. So they are typically serverless. Um, there are trade-offs though, because when you're working with a managed service, you are also limited for the most part by what they they surface within their API. So if you're taking advantage of this managed service, which provides some type of API, you're only able to kind of work with what they provide. So if you need something out of that, that's a limitation. So that's also you know something to consider. But for the most part, when you kind of take all these variables into account, I typically like to you know uh, lean towards a managed service if it, if it fits most of my needs. And I'm seeing more and more of this in the industry as well. So. Let's talk about how we can take advantage of AWS AppSync to build an API and kind of what is involved. Well, first of all, you'll go into either, you know, whatever infrastructure provisioning process that you like. So in this example, in my demo, I'm going to be using Cloud Development Kit, CDK. But you could go directly into the AWS dashboard. You could use something like Serverless Framework. There are dozens of different things that you can use to kind of do this. But, for, but, but you have to still do the, the exact same thing. So you have to define your schema. So this is typical of any GraphQL API. You know, you need your types, you need to define your GraphQL operations, your queries, your subscriptions, your mutations, and and then you know you're ready to roll from there. Um, once you've configured your uh, your your GraphQL schema, you have to start considering what type of authentication that you'd like to have. Do you want public access? Do you want private access? Or do you want a combination of both? And the API that we're going to be building, we're going to be uh, showing public access. But I'm also going to be kind of trying to, if I have time, showing you an API I've already built that has both public and private access. Once you've configured your authentication types, you then choose your data sources. And you can, you know, you start off with maybe one or two data sources. This can change, right? Over time, you might add data sources. You might remove data sources. Data sources can be anything from a um, microservice to an HTTP endpoint to a Lambda function to a direct database resolver. So with AppSync, we have the ability to map GraphQL operations directly into a data source without any type of you know, middle middleware. So um, what that's that's a very performant way to, to operate on your data source. And we have direct uh, resolver support for popular data sources like DynamoDB, uh, Amazon, Serverless Aurora, and Elasticsearch. 
or you can map your GraphQL operation into a Lambda function, which would, you know, of course, be able to talk to any data source. And that's what we're going to be doing in the demo today. We're going to map our GraphQL operations into a function, and then that, that way we have con uh, complete flexibility, control. We're running Node.js in our function. We can import stuff. We can uh, NPM install, all that stuff. Um, once you've uh, configured all of that, you have your schema, you have your data sources, now you need your resolvers. There's a couple of ways to go about this. Um, if you're using Amplify, Amplify will actually allow you to <clears throat> define uh, directives on your schema and will write the resolver logic for you for basic CRUD uh, and list operations. Uh, you can then modify that resol resolver logic or you can write your resolver logic from scratch. In this example, in, in our demo, I'm gonna be writing our resolver logic from scratch in AWS Lambda. And then from there, that's pretty much all you have to do. You then deploy your API and you're ready to test it out. So in this, uh, in this example, like I mentioned, I'm going to be using AWS CDK, but I want to go over a couple of other deployment options that are pretty popular with AppSync. And these are basically the, the most popular ones right now with AppSync. Uh, our number one um, you know, deployment option right now is AWS Amplify. Um, the second is serverless framework. The third is CDK. And then the last one is just raw cloud formation. But you can really deploy AppSync with anything that supports CloudFormation. CloudFormation is infrastructure as code for AWS. And anything that is supported uh, there works. So you could use uh, you can use Pulumi. You can use Terraform. Anything that supports CloudFormation for the most part. Um, one of the, the, the two that I'm going to actually go over right now, though, to kind of give you a little bit more in depth on is Amplify and CDK. So let's take a look now at AWS Amplify. Um, uh, Amplify actually provides a lot of additional benefits versus uh, using one of these others, just because of the tooling that kind of comes with the CLI, the Amplify CLI. Amplify CLI does GraphQL code generation. So every time you deploy an update, we will introspect your GraphQL schema and we will generate the code locally that you'll need for that, um, for your backend. And, and we do this on a per platform basis. So if you're working in iOS, we, we uh, build your code in Swift. If you're an Android, Flutter, React Native, a JavaScript app, we all detect that and we can give you the options for the language platform uh, that you're on. So if you're uh, in a JavaScript application, we give you the option between JavaScript, uh, TypeScript, or Flow. Um, from there, you can. we also have the GraphQL Transform Library with Amplify, which allows you to add directives directly onto your schema to add um, a lot of powerful functionality for you know building out very popular use cases within your API. So uh, with the GraphQL transform library, you can um, add directives like at auth for authorization rules directly on your schema. You can do stuff around uh, connections. So if you need relationships like one to many, many to one or many to many relationships, um, you can define those as well. There are like seven different directives um, and, and they're all pretty powerful. Um, and then you have the uh, uh, boilerplate code generation as well with Amplify, meaning that we will give you different schemas to kind of start with. And we also do a, a lot of other code generation as well outside of GraphQL. And then there's Amplify Data Store. Amplify Data Store is kind of a offline, um, you know, end-to-end -end implementation that we kind of give you basically out of the box if you're using Amplify. And it's kind of hard to replicate using CDK or serverless framework. Um, so anyway, there's a lot of stuff there, but um, I think that there's also limitations with Amplify because uh, with Amplify, the most of the GraphQL uh, um, resolver logic that we're creating for you is written in a language called VTL that we're replacing with JavaScript soon. But for now, VTL is just a language that not a lot of people know, so you have to kind of get up to speed with that. But we're going to be writing our resolvers today in, uh, in JavaScript. Um, and then the other that I'm going to be, the one I'm going to be doing today is AWS CDK. AWS CDK is infrastructure as code in your favorite programming language. So you can write CDK in um, Python, you can write it in JavaScript, you can write it in TypeScript, you can write it in Java. There's a bunch of different languages that are supported. Um, what I really like about CDK is the concise syntax. And if you are, if you've ever even looked at other infrastructure as code providers, like um, for um, you know a lot of people, they might have seen CloudFormation or uh, Pulumi or Terraform or Serverless Framework. Um, it's a little more, it's a lot more concise than some of those. It's maybe around the same as serverless framework, but the main difference between serverless framework and CDK is that with uh, serverless framework, you have a configuration file. So it can be YAML or it can be JSON. 
with CDK, you're actually writing your own real programming language. So I love writing JavaScript and TypeScript. So I really like CDK because I can write TypeScript. Um, CDK is just blowing up. So I like to be um, on the ground up or you know in a rising tide per se. So I, I see CDK as that. I, I see it's still early and it's growing rapidly and I like to be involved in those types of things. Um, and then also uh, one of the cool things is that in, is it integrates with Amplify. And that's what we're going to show off today. There's a couple of ways to do that. You can either extend an Amplify app with CDK or you can just deploy a CDK back end and then generate the, the client code that you'll need on the front end with Amplify. And that's kind of what we're going to do today. So with that being said, we're going to build a live demo. In this live demo, we're going to build a, a, an API gateway uh, using AppSync, um, deploy it to AWS. This API gateway is going to have two separate pieces of functionality. One, we're going to deploy a DynamoDB database, and uh, we're going to interact with that database uh, via our, our, um, our API. We're going to map the GraphQL operations into a Lambda function. Lambda is then going to talk to Dynamo and return the data uh, back to the client. We're also going to uh, build an API that does an image search uh, using the Unsplash API directly via our AppSync endpoint. So we're going to like have both of those APIs available. We'll be able to search images. We'll be able to create, update, uh, or actually create and list uh, data within our database. And we're going to hopefully do that within a couple of minutes. So uh, with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and get started. So. Um, I'm here in a folder, and I, I'm going to build out the back end, and I also have a front end that we're going to be using to test it out. So if I look in this folder, I see that I have my front end app. But now I want to go ahead and make a directory for my CDK back end. So I'm going to say make directory, and I'm going to say uh, CDK Cloud um, API. So we're in this uh, – whoops. We're in this new directory, uh, and, and what I want to do now is just initialize a new TypeScript uh, CDK project. So to do that, I can say CDK init, and then I can specify the language. So the language for me is TypeScript. And this is going to kind of generate a boilerplate CDK app. And then once this is deployed, or once, once this has been uh, created for us, we'll take a look inside of it. And then we're going to go ahead and install a couple of dependencies because when you're working with CDK, you have to kind of install each individual construct or class uh, that you're working with. So like I mentioned, we're going to be working with AppSync. We're going to be working with DynamoDB and Lambda. So we're going to install those three. So to do that, I can say, um, you know, yarn add or npm install at AWS CDK slash AWS Lambda. We can also install DynamoDB. and AppSync. And this is going to go ahead and install those three um, packages that we need. And then from there, we'll go ahead and open this up in our text editor. And now we have our Cloud API here, and we can start writing some code. So in a, in a CDK project, you're going to be given um, this lib folder where your main stack lives. And the stack is kind of where you write your infrastructure's code. And this is going to be where we, we write all of our actual CDK code. And the first thing you want to do is um, import the different modules that you want to work with. So we're going to be or, uh, working with CDK Core, AppSync, DynamoDB, and Lambda. So I went ahead and imported uh, all of those. And I'm going to kind of try to make sure that this uh, font size is large enough for everyone to see. I might zoom out slightly in just a moment um, when we're creating larger pieces of code blocks. So after we've imported these things, we're going to be using these uh, these four to create different pieces of infrastructure. So the first thing I want to do is create an API. So I'm going to scroll down here to um, to the beginning of this, and I'm going to declare an API. And I'm going to say uh, the API is going to kind of be set in a variable that we're going to be referencing later called API. And I'm going to say new AppSync API. Um, and then I'm going to give the API an ID, which is just going to be something, you know, uh, unique within your uh, apps within your CDK project, and then I need to specify the name, the schema location, and the authorization configuration. So these are the only things that are required. I'm also enabling X-ray, which is kind of a, a very nice way of debugging your 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 project or your backend your API. Um, so for the name, I can call this whatever I'd like to call it. So I might call this CDK Cloud API, something like that, and maybe 
API days just to kind of make it unique for this event. Um, and then I define where the schema is. So I'm, I'm basically saying I want to like go into this folder called GraphQL, and there I'm going to create a file called schema.graphql. And then for the authorization configuration, you can uh, define an authorization configuration for the base authorization type. So like what's the default authorization? Is it going to be public, private, whatever? And then you can add uh, optionally additional authorization modes. Now, I'm not going to be doing that today since we're just doing a public API, but I just kind of wanted to show, show that because it is possible. But this will automatically create the entire API. It will also you know, uh, create an API key, and then we're ready to go. And then what we might want to do from here is go ahead and define our GraphQL schema. So it's expecting it to be in a folder called uh, GraphQL. So I might um, go ahead and create that folder within the root of this project. Whoops. So I'll go ahead and do something like this. Whoops, I don't need it there. Just do that. So I'll call this GraphQL, and then I'll create a file called uh, schema.graphql. And this is going to be our schema. So I'll go ahead and um, go ahead and create a schema, and I'll walk through it real quick. Um, so we're going to have, like I mentioned, two different types of data we're working with. One is going to be um, a blogging app that we're going to create a database and interact with it. And then the other is going to be data coming back from Unsplash. So the Unsplash API returns an array of images. And the images have uh, these properties that I'm going to be working with, a width, a height, a description, uh, you know, various um, different pieces of metadata. And then we're going to have a, a URLs object, which is going to have different uh, you know, um, image URLs for different sizes of images. So we're going to have raw, full, regular, small, thumbnail, whatever. So that's that's those are the two types that I need. So we're going to have a type of image and a type of URL for Unsplash. Um, then we're going to have, for our actual database, a blogging uh, database. So we have a post type. And then we have a post input. And then finally, we have um, operations for, uh, for these different um, uh, types. So we have a query for listing posts. It's going to return an array of posts. Um, we also have a query for searching for images. So we're going to have. Um, you know, search images, pass in a string, and this is going to return an array of images. And then finally, we have a mutation for creating a post. And we also have a subscription created just to kind of show how subscriptions are created. Uh, to create a subscription, all you have to do is uh, add the at AWS underscore subscribe to any subscription definition, passing in an array of mutations. And we'll automatically wire up subscriptions that will scale to up to like tens of millions of connected clients based on, um, you know, our existing customers. So basically, that's kind of you know all it takes to add a subscription. But really, I'm not going to be testing the subscription out. The main thing I'm going to be testing out is the query and the mutation. So after we've defined our schema, we go back to our API. And we're going to now go ahead and create our DynamoDB table. And this is going to be the table. Well, actually. Be this one. There we go. So this is going to be the DynamoDB table that is going to hold our our posts for our API that we're you know about to deploy. And if you remember in the GraphQL schema, we had this post type here. So it basically, just needs an ID, a title, and a content field. Um, you know, we're going to be setting the partition key to that ID, and then anything else that we want to add, uh, we don't have to define that schema within uh, DynamoDB. And then for this, we might just give this um, you know, a, a name. So for this DynamoDB table, I might call this API days DB table or something like that. And then now that we've defined our DynamoDB table, we're going to create our Lambda function. And the Lambda function is going to be what talks to this table. So this is what creates our Lambda function. We're, we're basically saying we want to have a Lambda function. We're going to call it you know, API days Lambda function or something like that for the ID. Um, we're going to set the runtime to Node.js 12.x. We're going to then define where our Lambda function code lives. So we're going to create a folder called Lambda FNS. And then we're going to have a file all, file there called main.ts, like a main.typescript file with a handler function. We set the memory size. We set a couple of environment variables. Um, the two environment variables that we're going to need are the DynamoDB table name 
and the API key. And the API key is what comes from Unsplash. So I'm going to go ahead and, and, and expose this API key because I'm going to be deleting this uh, API in just a moment. But basically, I have this API key and the Unsplash um, API. I'm just going to copy it to my clipboard. And this is going to be the API key that we use. And then finally, um, I add the new Lambda function that we just created as a data source to the GraphQL API. So uh, the two main things to consider here are, I'm going to go ahead and, and kind of um, you know start minimizing this because we have so much going on. We've created our API. We've created our table. We've created our function. Those are the three main pieces of infrastructure we're going to need. And now we're going to like starting to tie them together. So the first thing we do to tie it together is we say we want to take this API and we want to add a Lambda data source. And then here we give it an ID or a name, and then we give it a, uh, you know, uh, we pass in the actual function that we're talking about. And then now we have our API connected to this Lambda function. And then we also need to do some, um, some additional access. So Because if we want our Lambda function that we just created to be able to interact with DynamoDB, we need to grant access to, to the, uh, the table from our Lambda function. So now we add this single line of code here. We're saying grant access to the, 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 um, the Lambda function from the table. And then the last two things we need to do are create our resolvers. So um, let's see here. The three resolvers that we're going to be working with are a uh, query for listing posts, a mutation for creating a post, and a query for searching images. And the way that we create these resolvers is we, we use that Lambda data source, and we say we want to create a resolver on that Lambda data source. Similar to how we called um, these two things here, we're kind of like piecing pieces together from our CDK project. So we're taking our Lambda data source, and we're adding it um, as a data source to our API. We're then granting access to our function, um, I'm sorry, to our table from our function. And then finally, we're adding our, our resolvers to our, uh, to our data source that we just created. This basically is a meaning we're going to now be able to kind of create a query in our schema, which we've already done, called list posts. And when that query is called, it's going to map this operation into that Lambda function. And then in that Lambda function, we then can handle that uh, request coming in, and it will come in as the event within the function. And then the last thing we might want to do is if we want to um, if we want to use this app uh, if we want to use this uh, API backend in a front end app we might need a few of these uh, resources so for instance we might need the API URL we might need the API key and other stuff like that you can either go into the AWS console and figure all that stuff out and kind of find it and all that but it's a lot easier just to use this CFN output. And this basically prints out these values to the terminal and then optionally allows you to also export these into another file. So what we're going to be doing is exporting these into a separate file, and that file is going to be consumed by our front end. And then finally, uh, we've done all of our CDK code, and we're done there. All we need to do now is create our Lambda function code. So um, if we go to our Lambda function again, we see that we... We said that the code is going to come from this Lambda FNS folder that we haven't created yet. And then we're going to have a main uh, file there. So let's go ahead and create that. Um, so basically, what I want to do is create a new folder here called Lambda FNS. And then we're going to create a new file called main.ts. Um, within our um, Lambda functions folder, we also need to have different resolvers. So we're going to need a resolver um, function for create, uh, creating a post. We're going to need a Lambda function for uh, listing posts. Oops, this needs to be TypeScript. The list posts. We also need a function for, um, what else? So create post, list post, search images. And we're all going to also going to need just a, ba a basic post post type for our, uh, you know, for our TypeScript. So for the posts, we're going to just have this match our GraphQL schema where we have an ID, a name, and a content field. And then this is going to be kind of uh, something we can now use for, um, you know, 
arguments and stuff within our other TypeScript files. For our main function, this is going to be kind of where the entry point of our um, let's see here. This is going to be where the um, entry point is for the event that comes through from AppSync. So when the function is um, invoked, it's going to be invoked with this event. And this event is going to be this AppSync event. And it has a bunch of different info that we're going to, we could work with if we want to. But the main thing that we're interested in is the field name, which is going to basically be the GraphQL field name. So this is coming off of the GraphQL info object. This is going to be either create posts, list posts, or search images. Then we have uh, the arguments. And this is just the GraphQL argument. So whatever we pass into the GraphQL operation as an argument will be available in this object here. And then we just import those files that we created just a, se a second ago. So create posts, list posts, search images, and the post type. And then we switch on the event info field name. So if it's create post, we invoke the create post function and we pass in the, uh, the post coming in from the arguments. If it's list posts, we just invoke list posts and return that. And if it's search images, we um, invoke search images passing in the query. Um, and then now we need to create the code for these uh, last three files. So let's go into, um, I guess, search images maybe. From, from this file, we are using um, this argument of query coming in from create post. We then say we want to get the API key off of the environment variable. And then basically all we need to do is pass in the query is equal to query. The client ID is equal to API key. We also notice that we're uh, importing Axios, but we don't really have that installed yet. So we can go ahead and install that now by going into the Lambda FNS folder. And what we want to do now is say npm init. And then install Axios. And that's all we need there. So we should see that, that that's resolved. So we're good there. Um, and then we're just kind of like, you know, calling axios.query passing, I'm sorry, axios.get passing in our query. And then that will just return the data that we need from uh, Unsplash. Uh, we're going to go to list posts. Um, this is going to be using the DynamoDB document client. And we're just going to scan the entire table by calling documentclient.scan. And then our parameters only take in the post uh, table as the environment variable. So like, what's the table name? This is coming off the environment variable that we set in our CDK code. And then finally, for create post, um, we're also using the DynamoDB document client. We're, we're saying we want to create a post. We're passing in the post as an argument. For our parameters, we have the table name with the environment variable of post table. And then we have the post itself. And then we just call it document client dot put, and then that's it. Um, this kind of should you know go ahead and do that. Um, you know, create the update in the DynamoDB table, and that's all we need from um, our code itself. So if I go to um, the, uh, my command line and I kind of go back a directory, and let's see, um, we're here, we're in our you know our back end. What you can now run is npm run build, and this is going to build out the, the the TypeScript and the JavaScript. So if I go here, I should see that this becomes now a bunch of different files because we have our, um, you know, our JavaScript and our TypeScript. So once the build is run, we can now run CDK diff to kind of see what infrastructure is going to be provisioned if we run a if we run a deployment. So we see that we're adding now all of these different resources. We're adding a GraphQL API. We're adding, uh, you know, a data source. We're adding a DynamoDB table, and we're adding a Lambda function. So let's go ahead and deploy this. So to do that, I can run CDK deploy. And this is going to go ahead and deploy all this. And while this is deploying, I'm going to go back one directory. I'm going to go ahead and open this up in my text editor with the front end. Um, because the back end, here. 
is going to have, there we go. This is gonna have like all the different, um, you know, configurations. But the one thing I was just looking for now is like the name of our stack and it's called CDK Cloud API Stack. It's usually a combination of the, the name of your, um, your API. As you see here, it's called CDK Cloud API, but with just with, uh, with different casing. So I'm gonna need the name of this stack uh, to work on the front end because basically in a moment, I want to um, export this configuration into another file that we're gonna use in just a moment. So I'm just kind of getting that ready, but I'll walk through that in just a moment. But um, while that's deploying, I'm gonna go ahead into the AWS console so we can go ahead and test this out because I know we're running kind of low on time. I go to AWS AppSync and then um, I search for the name of our, our API which is going to be whatever we defined here. CDK Cloud API days. Then we now have our graphical editor. So what I can basically do here is, oops, looks like it's not done, done deploying yet. So we'll give that a second. But yeah, once it's done deploying, we'll have uh, the API key and all that stuff that we can test it out with. So let's try that one more time. So what we can do now here is uh, test our API out using API key access. So I can say query search images. I might say dog. And this is gonna have like the description. And then I think the URLs is what we might be meant, uh, interested in. So let's try that out. There we go, we got our images coming back. So if I wanna to make sure that that's coming back right. We should be able to do that. See that we have our dog coming there. So that's working. Let's now query for a list of posts. But if we do this, we shouldn't get anything back because we haven't created any posts yet. But at least there's not an error. But what we might want to do now is just create a post. Post has an ID. Um, And then um, we want to maybe return an ID, title, content. And if we do that, we see that now we have our posts coming through. So we have all of the different operations you know, working. And then the last thing we, want, we might want to do is, um, see now we have two posts. And if we search again for something else, maybe like cat or something like that, then we see that we, you know, everything seems to be working. That's kind of my point. But <laughs> what we want to do now is, we want to um, export um, all of these, all the configuration that we just created here, um, where we, we define things like our API URL or API key and things like that. We want to export those to a file that we can consume in, in, in our front end app. So the way that we can do that is it's, when we run CDK deploy, we can add this optional flag of dash O, a dash o and we can say we want to kind of like go up one directory and we might want to kind of like deploy this into our front end app. And this is going to um, create a export uh, file um, wherever we set this directory. And I might call this like CDK exports.json. So we're going to say um, when we deploy any time now, we want to kind of like take all those resources, whatever they are, plop them into a file that we're going to then use on the front end. And um, we can now, you know, change into that front end app. Maybe uh, start it up. This is probably not going to work at first because um, I might need to make one small change. But just to kind of have it ready, we're going to now test out our image search from um, from Unsplash, and uh, that will be the end of this demo. And we'll have maybe a couple of minutes left for Q and A.
All right, so let's test this out. Looks like um, we need to, so we're importing this cloud uh, API stack from CDK cloud app slash CDK exports, but I think we can actually just go up one directory to CDK exports and this should work. Let me just see where we're at right here. Uh, it needs to be that JSON. Oh, no, it doesn't. That's not right. Let me try this one more time. Oh, I think I know the problem. I need to actually just move this file within this main directory. Some reason React wants to be that much of a pain. So now we're gonna go ahead and do search. So I'll say cats. And there we see we have cats coming back. Dog. And then finally, everyone's favorite, JavaScript. And there we go. We see we have some JavaScript related pictures. So that's it. Um, I hope you enjoy that. I'm gonna be sharing the uh, link to these to this code on on uh, Twitter in just a moment. You can follow me at Dabit three, like like right here. Um, also, check out if you're interested in this, checking out the CDK docs, the AppSync docs, and the Amplify docs. That's a great place to get started with all this stuff. Uh, also, reach out to me on Twitter if you have any questions, and I will go ahead and take a couple of questions here if there are any. Thank you. That's intense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, was, that was one of the more extensive uh, demos that I have seen. So that that's uh, quite a bit to be, to be covered there. Uh, very, very nice. I mean, the first comment we have in the chat, uh, only a service framework, Terraform and CloudFormation's CDK approach seems really mind blowing. I think that kind of sum summarizes it. The code driven approach is, is really great. Yeah. Um, yeah I mean like I would say for an example like this, you don't expect everyone to kind of to be able to replicate it, like, you know, just by watching this talk, but just seeing the end to end, like building from scratch, it kind of plants the seed for a lot of people. At least it did for me. Like when I saw someone build one of these from scratch, I was like, okay, this is, I understand how it works. So now I can go dig in and build something myself. Well, and, and like, you didn't really touch the admin, the uh, AWS interface really. And so like this, this brings the scoped context because of that huge world of AWS. Um, it brings a scoped context of, of deploying a project inside of a code repo, which is, I, I think, is a really uh, nice experience uh, for for coders. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, for, uh, for for me, like if, if I talk to someone that's learning, that wants to learn AWS, I just tell them, like, think of what you want to build and, and you can actually do most of what you need with a persistence layer, an API layer. Um, those two things are kind of the main thing and maybe some execution environment. And for, for most serverless apps, that's Lambda. Um, that's, you know, some database, either serverless Aurora, or DynamoDB is what I recommend. And then finally, an API layer, which could be which what I just showed, AppSync or API Gateway. Using just those three things, you can actually build out a lot of different types of apps. In fact, you can build most apps using just those three services. Yet AWS has 200 plus services. That's for, you know, you can do a lot more stuff with that, but it's not really necessary for for just getting started and for building out, you know, most example applications that you can consider that are actually like things that people put in production even. Yeah, most of the other services kind of go into that business domain, right? So uh, logging, tracing, of accesses, like, yeah, machine access learning, blocks, permission yeah. stuff. You can do stuff like, you know, um, uh, extract, transform, like load into other databases, all, all types of stuff, storage. But really, you know, for, 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 for just managing data, sending data across the wire, storing it, fetching it, different data access patterns, you can get a lot done with just those three services. We do have one question. Any support for local dev environments such as local stack or serverless offline? 
Um, so if you're working with the stack that I just used, you can actually test everything locally using um, the SAM CLI. And the SAM CLI should be available uh, if you're using CDK anyway, because you'll have the CD, uh, I'm sorry, the AWS CLI installed. And it's pretty easy to kind of get the SAM CLI uh, going because essentially all we're doing when we're testing locally is passing in the event object. And the event object just needs to match whatever the function is expecting. So that's just going to be an object. In my, in my case, it would be an object with like, um, you know, a field, a field name for the GraphQL info object and then whatever arguments you're passing into your function. Very cool. So again, go follow Natter. He's going to uh, drop those links in his Twitter. Uh, he always drops a lot of helpful resources, so definitely go follow in general. Uh, thanks again so much for coming and joining us. I know it's kind of early over there, so I appreciate you coming online. And uh, I'm going to hop over to the last talk for the track. Perfect. It was a pleasure being here. Thanks for having me. Uh, see you later.